FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Gold Corp. U.S. Gold Corp. is a U.S.-focused gold exploration and development company advancing high-potential projects in Wyoming and Nevada. U.S. Gold Corp. has consolidated a district on Nevada's productive cortex trend and is advancing the Copper King project towards production in Wyoming, led by a team of prolific company builders and renowned explorers, including Dave Mathewson, who is directly responsible for several major Nevada gold discoveries. U.S. Gold Corp. is well-capitalized and has an extremely tight share structure with less than $20 million shares outstanding and trades on the NASDAQ, a major exchange under the ticker symbol USAU. To learn more, go to usgoldcorp.gold. That's usgoldcorp.gold. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 529.19. Well, hey, as always, we love to hear your emails, your viewpoints, Love to get your emails, I should say. You can't really hear emails, although some of us can, I guess. Hey, the mm-hmm. email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. So send them off. There's a new uh, undisclosed coffee shop that will be opening around the corner from my home here in uh, northern Palm Beach County. So I'll be able to walk there and read your emails on the way. I'm also getting my son's dog. He's going off to Europe, sticking me with the dog. So, hey. I think that place is probably the best place to walk him, take care of a bunch of stuff at once. Anyway, well, you're tired of the lies, you're tired of the misinformation, the disinformation, and the out-and-out fraud. Well, the person you're about to hear from sure is. I'm talking about Chris Martinson, peakprosperity.com. Chris, welcome back. So lies, lies, and more lies, right? Yes, that's absolutely right, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So what is person to do because you're constantly being lied to and uh, there seems to be no interest in the truth is there well uh, is it interest or is it appetite or is it ability to handle it uh, i don't know where we fall on this right now um there it's a uh, you know i was just talking with somebody last night over a, a very long dinner we were discussing a really wide range of topics and this person has um, a lot of experience uh, outside of the united states as i do too i, I travel quite a bit and uh, one thing you notice when you travel outside the United States is that um, is that there's almost like this bubble over the United States that uh, it, it's got its own uh, propaganda echo chamber. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you just can't have conversations inside the United States as easily as you can outside where people are a little bit more curious. They, they don't know for sure what's happening, that they, they can entertain a wider range of possibilities. But in the United States, what's called the Overton window, the polite conversation, yes. it's a really tiny little window and it's just really small, you know, you and, know saying, and you exactly. find different groups have different sort of, you know, Overton windows that they can talk about. But it's like, like there's certain topics that are just verboten here. Right. And, uh, you know, if you, with some people. And mm-hmm. I think one of those would be the whole idea of Russiagate and what Russia really did, all of that, you know, or, or um, U.S. foreign policy, where people are just insane about it. You know, mm-hmm. Mike Pompeo yesterday says, you know, we're going to keep the pressure on Iran until they respect the rights of their people. And I'm one of these people that goes to the rights of the people. Yeah. I believe that the Constitution gave me rights uh, against unreasonable government search and seizure. I believe it's enshrined in an amendment. And I believe the NSA violated that. And I believe the director of the NSA uh, lied about that to Congress and nothing happened. So what is it that we care about the rights again? So, uh, you know, it, it's just it's just come to a fever pitch where and, and here's my theory behind this, that underneath the covers, things are so rotten, mm. so close to crumbling that those pe- people and institutions and people whose jobs depend on the system not being rotten and not crumbling are desperately trying to do everything they can to pretend like everything's okay. And the way, one of the ways they do that is they don't allow you to talk about the ways things are not okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways in that regard for sure. You know, you look and you see like the economy has never recovered to where it was in 06, 07. You see that in the housing. New housing is two-thirds of what it was then, and 
pre-owned housing, you know, is about the same. It, it's just uh, this illusion or delusion that things have gotten back to so-called normal, right? Yeah, and a lot of that is is uh, narrative control by the powers that be. You know, I, I believe um, that the markets need quotes around them, markets, because they're not really markets anymore where, where mm -hmm. prices are discovered in a free and fair way. I believe that markets now are largely a government utility. And by that, I mean, um, it's not just, you know, the Treasury Department controlling it, but that there's a, a ring of protected industries that surround the Treasury Department. That would include companies like Citadel and all these other, yeah. you know, big high volume HFT companies. And, and together, they're locked together in this idea of saying, and they've got, I'm sure they've got a very compelling narrative that makes sense to them. Listen, it's really important. We, we couldn't really, the, the, you know, gosh, we're at a delicate part with our trade negotiations. So we need to send strength, uh, as a signal through the markets. You know, we can't let gold get out of control right now. Cause that was into bad signal. I'm, I'm whatever the reasons are, um, they've been controlling the markets to send signals. And that means it's a utility and it's got utility pricing. And one of the things it's not doing is our markets are no longer telegraphing appropriate signals to us. Right. And I wrote a big long article about that called the company store, which basically points out this idea that the real producers of real wealth. So these are the people who convert sunlight into corn. They take ore out of the ground, very expensive, labor intensive, high risk process and turn it into metal that those people have, have seen their profits basically hover around zero for decades, right? Mm -hmm. Say, simple argument, corn today on a per bushel basis costs exactly the same nominal, not inflation adjusted, exactly the same as it did 22 years ago, right? right. Think about yeah. input costs over the last 22 years, right? Land, fertilizer, seed corn, uh, diesel fuel, all those input costs have exploded, right? Mm -hmm. And so the way the farmers have had to navigate that territory is by going deeper and deeper into debt. And of course, debt is is just a thing where you understand once you understand how financial markets work, debt is good. Banks just make debt up out of thin air like they loan you money and they make money out of thin air and then they harvest your your output over time and in interest. And so mm -hmm. when you look at this, you look at the real producers of wealth, basically almost always for those last 20 years have had their noses barely above water. And so these are the producers of real wealth, the people who are taking real risk. But who's harvesting? there's actually a lot of value in a bushel of corn. Who harvests that? I mean, by the time that corn gets made into cornflakes and shows up on my store shelf, it somehow turned into $5 a box, right? So somewhere in there, somebody made a lot of money and who was that? Um, and we find that most of the profits of our culture are going to the financialized participants, yes. right? They're harvesting almost all of that, which makes them the, the equivalent of owners of the company store, right? The miners would have to work in the mines and then they were only allowed to sell, you know, use their script. They were handed for their labor at the company store with massive markups and they could barely keep their noses above water. Mm -hmm. And it was a very predatory system. And so that's what I'm seeing go on. The price of silver right now, for instance, is below the cost of production for most of the major producers. And it's an absolute travesty that yes. the price of silver is set by not producers, not consumers, but by this overarching architecture of predatory, we call them speculators, but they're just, they're parasites. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you see uh, the financialization of the economy is really, really, that's what's kind of put us over the edge here, hasn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah, and it, yeah, it has. It's it's a big tragedy because the the financialized people they know the price of everything but the value of nothing. They don't produce anything. They really take no risk at all. They, wow. they don't put any work in. And I know that hedge fund operators would disagree strongly, and private equity people say, "Oh, we take enormous risk, Chris. You don't understand. We have billions at risk." But the truth is, they don't start any companies. They don't have to gauge market demand. They don't have to figure out how to outcompete a, a another producer. Um, you know, doing hard work. And th so the financialization has really strip mined a, a lot of our industry. And so, you know, Trump comes forward, a trade war, China's, you know, doing bad things to us. But the truth is, th that's not exactly right. Um, what happened was uh, the financialization made it almost impossible to produce anything at a profit in the United States. So corporations picked up and moved to places they could do business uh, you know, and, and with labor costs and, and, uh, do it more profitably. That that's what happened. Um, Absolutely. and no, you're a hundred percent spot on, um, you know, and, and really it's a cancer 
it's not just the United States. It's all over the freaking world here, even in the so-called developing nations, maybe especially, because if you've got a gold mine in Ghana, how are you going to finance it? You know, maybe you can get a bank to do it, or worse yet, to uh, you know, find other sources of capital. But you're going to pay through the nose, and one of the things you're going to have to do is sell your production into the future market to ensure the bank uh, gets repaid. You know, it's right. kind of madness here. Well, it is, and th- and that great hollowing out, I think, is is when I mentioned before, there's this rot that nobody really wants to talk about. The truth is, it's a rotten system, and financialization and speculation don't generate wealth. They they suck wealth out. And as we saw a few years ago, the Panama Papers comes out. It's just one of it, one one leak out of a thousand. I'm sure that that could happen, but it was the one that did happen to happen, and it and it showed that everybody from the Queen of England. Down to, you know, Larry, the private equity guy was busy, you know, taking trillions of dollars and hiding them in offshore uh, tax vehicles. And so that's what financialization has given us this, this, uh, you know, super predatory elite who have more money than they can possibly spend. And they use money to make money and they keep harvesting that and tucking it away in offshore accounts and other vehicles and places. And they use it to subvert the political process and rewrite tax codes to their benefit and do all the tricks that you would do if you had such a wealth advantage uh, to, to maintain that. But it's gone on far enough now that we're starting to see the first wrinkles of the very wealthy getting concerned. And some of them are billionaires with bug out shelters in New Zealand. Some of them are like Ray Dalio coming out going, geez, something seems to be a little off in capitalism, you know, but uh, sorry, Ray, little. it's not capitalism. No, it's definitely <laughs> not. It's, it's corporatism. Passes. It's a totally different thing. <laughs> hey, you know what I, you know what I compare it to? Like that, we have this thing called food. And really, it's most of what's out there, Chris, is what's pa- what passes for food. Like McDonald's, right. fast food passes for food. It's not food. It passes for it. It's very rare to find real food. And our economic system is exactly the same thing. This is what passes for capitalism, but it's really not. It's crapitalism. It's whatever else you want to call it. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a whole bunch of different terms. Creditism. But there's no capitalism left. Not when you walk into a store, you pull out your credit card, you charge up a basket of groceries, and that adds to the money supply. You know, there's something wrong with uh, with everything that we're seeing here. Yeah, and and you know, so we had, um, you know, I have to rewind the tape a little bit here. Woo, let's go back to 1994. There was this hiccup in the corporate bond market, and it freaked out the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan at the time. And so they did something where they opened up the credit spigots hugely by creating a program called the Sweeps Program. Invite any listener to look this up. Basically, it allows a bank to sweep your demand account. That's checking savings into an overnight money market account with your name on it, but it's a time deposit, so they don't have to hold reserves against it. This was just a fancy sort of a way to to allow banks not to have to hold reserves anymore. So guess what? Banks with zero reserve requirements can loan an infinite amount. Hey, and so then we got the roaring 90s, big credit bubble that blew up, right? Mm -hmm. And so what did did we get? Well, now we got these 1% Bernanke blowout rates, you know? And then we got this side bubble called the housing bubble. That wasn't the main story. That was still a side bubble. Bad. It was pretty destructive. People consider it the main bubble, but it wasn't. And then we got Yellen and we got our 0% never before in 5,000 year blowout credit, you know, uh, extravaganza, negative yields in Europe, all this crazy stuff, right? And still, this is, you know, now that we're here with the everything bubble that we're talking about when this burst, we still have to rewind the tape all the way back to the late 70s, early 80s, which is when the world went on this financialization experiment. And the experiment was rooted in this really dumb idea. You could grow credit at twice the rate you could grow income. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do that for a while and you can yeah. play games. And as long as you concentrate the wealth and, you know, all of it's ending up in a very few hands. So mainly they're competing over like trophy art, properties, mm-hmm. Gulf streams, gems, stuff like that. Right. Uh, you know, it doesn't really show up in the larger system. You can continue that for a while, but it's still rooted in this idea that you can grow your credit, your claims yeah, so at twice the rate GDP. you can grow your income. You can't do that. And that's Absolutely. where we are. That's what they're trying to preserve so desperately is another couple of turns of that wheel. But anybody with grade school math skills can say, you can't do that forever. This ain't going to work. It's not. Right. It can't work. Right. We know that it can't work. Uh, we've seen this before. You know, it's a lot like uh, just like an individual homeowner 
who hawks everything in the house, hawks the house, and uh, borrows, leases an auto. And how long can that go on unless his income, unless your income goes up? It just can't, right? Right, right. And, and so that's the larger sweep of the story. And, you know, meanwhile, you have the United States very, very busy uh, alienating pretty much everybody on the planet at this point, which I think is a bad strategy. You know, the, the whole bully strategy is, is fine for a while, but we're doing everything from, you know, threatening uh, Germany's uh, energy supplies by threatening to sanction the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, mm-hmm. which they desperately need, right? Telling them that they can't buy Iranian oil and, and uh, you know, uh, telling China that, you know, they have to bend to every one of our trade demands, and which is, I consider, negotiating in bad faith. Not that we don't need a different trade deal with China, but I'm just saying the strategy, the way, the approach, the methods, um, yeah. you know, the, the whole gotcha. carry a big stick and threaten everybody in the world. That's cool when there's plenty of resources to divvy up, but when things get tight, like they are now, because we're at the end of this stupid credit bubble idea that began in the late 70s, we're at the tail end of of cheap energy at this point in time, we're at the tail end of all kinds of things. It's just, it says it's it's a new world, but I feel like the United States is kind of like that old guy at the end of the block who, who's, you know, tells you to screams at you to get off their lawn. They're really stuck in their ways. You yeah, know? He's like ready it, for the it, nursing home. Yeah, it's a new world. You know, there's more people living on your block. It's just how it happens, you know, but they can't adjust to that. And and so uh, it feels to me like we're at that uncomfortable spot in history where things are changing really rapidly. And the United States is defaulted by slipping back into old behaviors, you know, mm-hmm. um, but instead of adjusting to the new reality. So I, I don't see a lot of fresh air politically out there. <laughs> and and the, the thing that cracks me up is seeing who the top Democratic National Committee polling people are. like Joe Biden is polling yeah. at the top. Stop the, the bus. Let me yeah, off. This, yeah. Come on. Oh, you know? him, Joe Biden. Let's, it's a joke. Just what we need. Another aging white guy with old ideas who hasn't had an original one in probably 50 years who does creepy things on tape. You know, it's just like, come on. That's like not even remotely where we need to be in this story. But that's mm. all the system can think to elevate. And uh, and put forward at this point in time, because it's it really to do other than Joe Biden to to Mm -hmm. elevate somebody with fresh ideas who really comports with this new world means you would have to recognize that it is a new world and that there's a lot of rot in the old one and face that directly. So um, it's just like Joe Joe Biden is the ultimate. He's like the poster child for a nation in denial, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Yeah, well, I think uh, his his pull bounce will be short lived. Because he's one of those kind of candidates, the more you find out about him, the less you like him. There's a lot of them out there like that this time around. But yep. uh, he's not, he, he, physically, you look at him, he's a wreck. So, I mean, he's 76 years old. I hope I'm in that good shape when I'm 76. But I wouldn't uh, pretend to want to be running the country or the world at that age. You know, it's craziness. craziness. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh uh, he's, he's, uh, I'm not sure what more people need to find out about him, but he's, uh, there's so much stank on that candidate oh. that again, the fact that the media isn't running with that, like his, his son Hunter, uh, Biden totally was up corrupt. to all kinds of skullduggery. And, and there's like, if any of the things that Hunter Biden had done had been done by Trump Jr. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, the, the, the volume and rightly so, I believe, right. of, of uh, you know, media inquiry and hate around that would be extraordinary. This is really ugly stuff with Ukraine and China, and it just it looks money grubbing because it is, and it's, mm-hmm. it's just nasty. Um, yeah. So we really desperately need a, a swamp draining, and I'm just afraid that we're, we're too far gone to really get the one that we need at this point in time. Oh, I totally um, agree. Tr- you know, Trump didn't get it done. He, he actually installed more swamp critters than than Obama did practically. And that was a hard, that was a tough mm-hmm. bar to, to exceed. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hey, uh, but we'll see what happens with the, uh, with the unmasking of all of the, uh, spying that was going on with Trump. Cause that could definitely have the potential to blow it all out, you know, to really, well, it, it could. And, you know, I'm, I'm as hopeful as the next person to say, you know, we would, it, we'd love to see some actual consequences fall where they should. Um, but I'm still not holding my breath because these things have a bad habit of just sort of getting swept under yeah, um, they and going do. away. Hey, they certainly do. And I don't, uh, I totally don't disagree with you there, but, um, yeah, you got to have a little bit of hope, I guess, tempered sure. by reality. <laughs> yeah. 
tempered by reality. You have to, you have to have a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, amazing that it's gone on as long as it has. And no one seems to want to do anything about it. So hopefully something will come about. So in the meantime, we got all these problems here. Chris, what do you do about it? You, the individual, to protect your family, yourself, et cetera. Well, uh, this is where I I think people need to be prepared for the fact that these changes are coming. There is a new world coming. It's spiraling down on us really rapidly. I think people have to become the change they wish to see. You don't Mm -hmm. wait to read about it above the fold in the Wall Street Journal. Don't wait for your friends to start doing it. You know, you have to get out there and start becoming more resilient, right? And this means uh, really going through and building up those eight forms of capital we talk about in Prosper, uh, Mm -hmm. which is our solution book that Adam Taggart and I wrote. And, you know, build up your financial capital for sure, but also your social capital and your living capital. Don't be eating that McDonald's food, right? There's a lot of poisonous food out there. So make sure your body, your living capital is uh, in good shape and, and um, you know, really, really uh, healthy. And build up your knowledge, your skills. You know, that's a form of capital that you can transport with you anywhere you need to go. Because I believe that when this bubble bursts, I'm not talking like the everything bubble. I'm not talking like stocks retreat 40%. If I'm right, what we're facing is the collapse of a bubble that began back in the late 70s, early 80s. As we talked about, that's going to take decades to work itself through. And that's if we're lucky. So I Mm -hmm. think it's it's we're coming into a really hard period of time. So we recommend diversified income streams, because if you have a single job and a single paycheck, you're exposed and understanding the difference between wealth and Mm -hmm. claims on wealth. Right. Real wealth. Land hard, tangible assets, productive assets, and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's not the ones and zeros on a hard disk that say you have a portfolio with uh, Merrill Lynch, right? It's, it's, you know, you got to have real assets in this story because we just printed up way too many claims. And, you know, the next part of this story is easy to predict. The central banks are going to print like crazy again when they have to. Only this time, I think it sort of, you know, nudges us closer to that Venezuela style outcome. Think so, huh? Like we become yeah. Venezuela, huh? Well, you you have two choices. I, I'm an Austrian economist at heart uh, when it comes down to these things um, in a number of respects. And I think they got the credit markets right. And so that von Mises quote that says, um, you know, either you voluntarily abandon your credit cycle or you face the destruction of the currency system involved. Right. The fact that we've had all the central banks sort of colluding on creating and perpetuating mm-hmm. this credit cycle, and that includes People's Bank of China, Japan, ECB, Fed, they're all in on it. But all they've really done is if just created, you know, let the credit just run too, too, too far. And the currency system ran too, too, too far. So, yeah. uh, you know, sooner or later, the amount of real stuff and the claims on real stuff, that that's a, uh, an, an equation that has to balance again at some point in time. So either you believe we're going to triple the size of the world economy magically, or you believe the claims get reduced in some fashion. How do they reduce? Well, deflation, they blow up and that's very bad and people hate that. And the people who hold the claims are also in power. So they actually don't like that. Uh, Uh, So they always go for the other one, which is the inflationary outcome. Why do you do that? Well, that's because you steal from everybody. So billions pay into that system (laughs) and eat the losses rather than the 3000 who own it all. Right. So That's guess which one's socialism. More popular. That's called yeah. socialism, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's why we can't say we have capitalism, because it's clear that, you know, we, we, capitalism only applies in certain narrow t- times and in places, which includes the fact that little people eat the losses. But the big people, you know, Goldman Sachs really gets in trouble and is in danger of going tits up because they made some bad decisions. You know, they're going to get bailed out. Right. Because hey, reasons. Right. You remember uh, Leonia Helmsley. Uh, when she, yeah. what she said to her maid that taxes are for little people to pay, right? Yep. The big yep. people don't pay taxes. And I think that's where we're kind of at here. The, the dual system of justice, the dual economic system. If you're up from the food chain of the people that get to benefit from the newly created uh, digital dollar economy, you're a cleaning clock, whether you're in the financial sector, or whatever. If you're, In Main Street, and you actually make stuff for a living and use your hands and work, that type of work has been uh, wholesalely diminished. I mean, look, I sent my kids to college. I didn't want my son to work in a loom um, 
producing textiles, you know, it's better a third world country does it. It's only natural that you want what's better for your kids, but really, is it better that your kid knows how to fix your car and knows how to weld together some metal and they get paid above average income than from somebody in Main Street? You know, welder now 80, 90,000 a year, first year out of trade school. So maybe we all made a big mistake because we bought into the, uh, hey, it's much more dignified and much more socially uh, superior to work in an office and wear a suit and jacket to a tie and jacket to work every day than it is to wear work clothes and work boots and go actually make stuff. I mean, we're kind of going back to what you started talking about. So it's a values thing in our society. In China, I don't think they look down on those working people the way they do here in the U.S. Well, it's it's absolutely true that um, one of the things that our school system does is it wants everybody to buy into this narrative that the way you are successful is you get as much education as you can and you go out and you and you, and you get a, as much of a paycheck as you can. Mm-hmm. When the true fact is the people who really actually get rich, none of them work for paychecks, right? Yeah. They all start businesses. They all, so um, you know, yeah, they're entrepreneurs in some way, shape or form. And that the tax laws are actually fashioned in a way that punishes yeah. you most if you're a worker and the more successful you are as a worker, the more punishing the tax code becomes <laughs> the most punishing up. portion section of the tax code is for a small business person who runs um, their own small business, right? You might pay upwards of 60%, depending on the state you're in. If you're like a, a doctor with a, with a five person practice or a lawyer with a small law firm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, if you're, if you are a Leona Helmsley, if you're in the real estate sector, paying 0% taxes is, is very ordinary. Um, in fact, you're doing something wrong if you're a real estate investor and you're not paying 0% in taxes. And that's because the government wants houses and it wants things, you know, it, 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 it incentivizes certain behaviors, but it's a mystery to me why capital gets taxed out at a max rate of 20% where income gets taxed out at a max rate of 60%. Um, once you factor in the small business person paying their own FICA, Medicare, state taxes, all that stuff, right? Uh, it's just a mystery, but you know that's what the government has said. It said, if you work in this sector, we're going to hit you with 60%. Over here, it's 20% to 0%. So we, we reward money, making money off of money. Let me tell and you, Chris. We, ta- we tax people hardest who, uh, who actually generate uh, in real wealth and provide real services. It's even worse than that because if – your primary income is passive, okay, and or your uh, whatever passive or just it's not actively earned. Under the new tax law, using some creative strategies that uh, several people I know have designed, you are actually in a position where you can get away with paying virtually no taxes, and we can show you how to do it completely legal. But what you're saying about what's happened to the working guy, this last tax bill totally screwed him. I think we're going to have to leave it at that, but peakprosperity.com, go check it out. Uh, What will you see when you go to Peak Prosperity, Chris? Oh, we've got all kinds of podcasts and we've got all kinds of written articles, but mostly it's, it's a community of people who see these changes coming and want to know, hey, what should I do about it? So uh, come on by, check it out. A lot of great content there. A lot of great content. Uh, Excellent articles and videos and podcasts done by Chris and company. Highly recommend it. Hey, questions, comments for Chris, myself, just to give us a yell here, email me, kl at kerrylutz.com. Everything gets answered. I'm probably about 300 behind right now. Chris, I had the best Memorial Day weekend, hanging out with so many friends and uh, loved ones. It really was a wonderful time, and it gives you a chance to think about what the hell is going on. It really recharged my batteries. So, hey, take a look at the site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com, newsletter about to go out any, well, tomorrow it's going to go out, assuming uh, I can finish it up. It's always great having you on, Chris. We will talk to you again real soon. Thank you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.